Hey friends, Todd here doing a little prophetic pondering about the craziness of the days in which we live and the nearness of the return of Christ for the rapture of the church. And my friends, that just seems to be more and more upon us all the time. And um, I, I don't see anything, uh, as I say all the time, I don't see anything that would um, that would persuade me otherwise that we still have just oodles and oodles of time left. Um, may we have more time than I anticipate? Sure, uh, of course. But, um, boy, if you know if you know prophecy, if you know the things that the Bible tells us um, specifically to look for, and then some things that the Bible uh, tells us that will be um, uh, hallmarks and characteristics of people in the last days, and then as the Bible tells us the condition the world will be in and specific things about that, even three and a half years into God's wrath being poured out on the world in, uh, in a period of time known as the day of the Lord. Um, as you see all of those things, if you know the things to look for, you just see the world that we live in lining up so perfectly with scripture over and over and over and over again. And so, man, um, I, I got to tell you, I, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't find myself coming to a lot of really super encouraging messages. Um, I just, I see the days that we live in as, as bad, and it's gonna get worse. And, and, and I, I, I will freely admit that that sure feels an awful lot like pessimism. And I'm a pretty optimistic cat um, by nature. But in terms of the condition of the world, uh, the way things are going, I got something on my glasses and it's making me crazy. Um, in condition, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the direction I see the world going and look, the, the story of, hey, it's bad and it's gonna get worse. That's really the story of the world after the church is taken out in the rapture because it starts off bad and it just continues to amplify and get worse. And yeah, that's the very thing Jesus told us to watch for. He told us these signs that would be heralds of his coming and they're often referred to as birth pains because that's what Jesus likened them to. He, um, he said that these are the beginning of birth pains and we know that birth pains, we, uh, all prophecy folks know this, that birth pains increase and intensity, and they increase in frequency up until the point where the baby is born. And so as you see these things happening rapid fire, you really can only be left with one conclusion is that we are just getting that much closer. Um, I'm not a date setter. Um, I, I do watch specific days as, uh, as they kind of rise to the level of kind of meriting being watched. But uh, you don't have to be a date setter, man, to see the day of the Lord approaching. And that is what we're looking for. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together as some, have been, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The day there is capital D. And it's the day of the Lord. It is the prophesied time of judgment when God separates the righteous from the unrighteous, and the righteous are given reward, and the unrighteous are given wrath and vengeance and judgment and retribution, and it's brutal. It's an entirely different program for those who are left on the earth uh, than anything that's ever been seen. Um, it is the wrath of God being poured out universally on the world and primarily to discipline Israel so that they come to a place of repentance, but also just for punishment. And, and the, the Bible is clear about that, that that is a time of punishment. Um, go back and look at my uh, Dig Into the Revelation 6 playlist and, and the more recent videos. I've got a, a, a lot of content on the Day of the Lord. And I'm telling you, that study has changed fundamentally um, my perspective of of so much of what you see in the end times um, story, specifically as told in Revelation. I think a proper understanding of the day of the Lord 
um, starts eliminating some pre um, some preconceived ideas that we had about certain aspects of um, of the of, of the story that takes place during the tribulation is what's commonly called the tribulation that seven year period after the church is removed and we're going to talk about one of those things today uh, tonight I should say today. <laughs> It actually is the next day. It's after midnight as we're doing some late night pondering. But um, but that's really kind of um, what we're going to talk about. But before I get into that, I, I want to pause and stop and give the gospel news, the good news to someone that hopefully is watching and stumbled upon this video and for whatever reason is watching now and that but they don't have a faith-based relationship with Jesus Christ. They've never believed in him as, as the Savior, uh, the one who paid the price for their sins. And man, if that's you, I pray that you would hang on here just another couple of minutes and just give me just a few uh, moments to, to tell you the good news, because the, the good news is desperately and sorely needed, not just because the world that we see around us is deteriorating and spiraling, um, further and further down the drain, um, it is. But because you and I are born into um, a condition that is one of profoundly bad news because we are born into a state of sin and that sin creates a separation between us and God. And it's a big deal. It's a bigger deal than that could ever make it sound. Because if that separation from God that sin causes is never dealt with, then it becomes permanent. And your separation from God becomes permanent. It's, it's, it's plain in Scripture. You and I will live on past this world. Um, we are not just a physical existence. We are a spiritual one as well. And you will spend eternity forever in one of two places either in heaven in the presence of God and in the presence of Jesus and in the presence of other, <laughs> other like-minded believers who, who have placed their faith in Jesus, or you will spend it in a place of torment called hell. And that's not real popular. Um, you know, when I grew up, churches talked a lot about hell. They don't talk a whole lot about hell anymore. Um, it is immensely unpopular. And the, to even... Um, give an inkling that someone may be going there um, is, is just seems to be kind of a taboo topic. But the Bible's, the Bible is clear about it. And so that's your, you know, one of those two places is where you, if you're watching this, you're going to spend eternity in one of those two places. So if tonight, regardless of when the rapture happens, regardless of anything with Bible prophecy, if you were to close your eyes when you hit the pillow tonight and not wake up, where would you spend eternity? If you cannot confidently say that you would spend it in heaven because of the work of Jesus Christ, then what you need is the good news. Because the good news is that Jesus died on the cross in your place for your sins so that the penalty that sin demanded would be paid by him. And you would not have to bear the weight of that on yourself. It is immensely, profoundly good news. And that's what gospel means. And we see, it, look, we see the gospel in scripture throughout the pages of both Old and New Testament. Old, Old Testament pointing to Jesus as the means of salvation and uh, the New Testament revealing him as such. And the good news is the gospel is summed up really well in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 2 through 4 say, this is the gospel or the good news that saves you, that Christ died on the cross for your sins according to scripture and was buried and raised to life again on the third day according to scripture. So what that tells you is that, you know, when it says this is the gospel that saves you or by which you are saved, that means you need saving. And you do, I do, because the, the, the payment for sin has to be paid by somebody. It's either going to be paid by Jesus on the cross and you receiving that for yourself as, as, as his payment. Look, I could write you a check for $100,000. Now, it wouldn't be any good, 
but say I had the funds to do so. I could write you a check for $100,000, but if you never cashed it, um, it would do you no good. It's not really yours until you receive it and do what do with it what you should. Um, and so we're going to talk about how do you do that with what Jesus did on the cross. I'm going to tell it to you in, in an ABC proposition. The A being that you admit that you're a sinner. The B being that you believe in Jesus. And the C being that you confess that with your mouth. And so here's here's where we see scriptural, uh, uh, I don't want to say evidence, but here's where we see scripture pointing to these very things. Regarding sin, admitting you're a sinner. Look, you won't you won't seek a cure for an illness you don't know that you have, right? Um you got to know you're sick before you'll seek to get well. And the Bible is very clear. You, me, everybody, the best of us, the worst of us, all have sinned. It says as much in Romans 3.23. It says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that is a big deal because Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. And so all have sinned. And the wage that is given because of sin to everybody is death. And that death is not merely the death in this life, but it's eternal death. And we know that because the next, the next part of that verse, Romans 6, 23, contrasts death with eternal life. So we know they're both talking about an eternal state, not just a temporal one. That, that verse starts by saying, for the wages of sin is death, but it goes on to say, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So see, God doesn't, his, his, his hope for you is not that you receive the wage that sin brings, but that you would receive the gift. A gift is very different than a wage. It doesn't have to be worked for. It doesn't have to be earned. Um, you cannot be good enough to earn this gift. It, it, it was bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord so that Jesus dying on the cross brings you the opportunity to have eternal life. You receive that as your own by believing. That's the B and the ABCs. You believe in Jesus. John 3.16, most well-known verse in scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Believing is the key to it all. And believing that Jesus is the only way that your sin gets dealt with. He said as much in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. No one has their relationship with God restored and that damage undone unless that happens through the work of Christ on the cross. If you can believe that Jesus was who he said he was and that his death on the cross accomplished what he said it did, believing that, ah, my nose is itching. <laughs> um, believing that is what leads to eternal life, is what leads to, to your salvation, your opportunity, your, your, no, your assurance. Believing that leads to the assurance that you will spend eternity with God. And again, you can't earn it. You can't be good enough to earn it. You can't be good enough to keep it. You can't be good enough to add something to it. Um, we are all expected to grow in maturity in Christ and in discipleship. Um, but that is not the same thing as salvation. Salvation is you come to Jesus as you are and you place your faith in him today. No matter what you've done, you cannot out -sin the grace that Jesus offers through the cross. If you believe that, all that's left is to confess it. That's the C. Uh, Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I pray you do that today, my friends, because um, time is short and it. It's not only getting shorter, but um, man, I tell you, I sit down here and my nose just starts itching like crazy. It's not itched all day long. Um, 
you know, time is not only like short and getting shorter, but like time that after the, the rapture of the church for those that are left, it is unbearably, unspeakably grim. Um, it, it, it's bad, my friends, and you don't want to be here for it. Place your faith in Jesus today. All right, we're going to we're gonna dig in. Um, it's late and I'm tired already. And um, I'm going to cut my tea, so grab a beverage. We're going to do a little Bible study in tonight. So I tell you, continue, thank God, um, to just really um, be blessed to be um, in my in my uh, my my personal time with God. I just keep being driven to the pages of Scripture, and more and more things just kind of come alive. And I find myself just in these deep studies that I don't plan; um, they just kind of come about. And so we're going to look at the two witnesses from Revelation chapter eleven because this is relevant to. Uh, I mentioned them. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of couple of videos ago, rather, and um, I, I feel like um, I kind of touched on uh, some of them, uh, some of their, uh, you know, what we would think would be their ministry, kind of what the outcome of that would be. But the more I dug, and, and actually, as is always the case, um, or I shouldn't say always, but frequently the case. You know, someone asked a question, and when I looked into the question a little bit, I found that my answer revealed something, um, something a little deeper. So we're just going to go um, and look at the two witnesses, what the Bible says about them, what the Bible doesn't say about them, because look, here's here's what I have found in uh, in the last few years, have I, as as my uh, I've I've shared with you guys before my interpretation of the events of the end times, specifically in Revelation, uh, has has really used to be a hundred percent in line with what would be considered the traditional view of um, someone who would be pre-tribulation, uh, a pre-tribulational, and um, believing in you know, a dispensational age of grace, followed by a time of judgment, followed by a millennial reign of Christ. Um, you know, I, I, I did and believe all those things, but the, that, the, the traditional view of someone with that kind of framework was um, what I had. And it's, I have diverged as I've started digging in for myself and not just kind of parroting what I've heard other people teach over on, on this subject, um, the prevailing view over the years. And when I say over the years, I mean over the years. I mean, I was, um, I've shared, I, my mom is a, is a wonderful godly woman and I uh, was brought up in a Christian home and um, she was very much into prophecy, still is. And she's she's one of my, uh, my, my top prophecy buddies. And she is, uh, I, you know, I grew up with, you know, the late great planet Earth uh, on our bookshelf and, you know, went to see uh, Jack Van Impey back in the day um, at, at a revival. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just grew up and prophecy was just kind of a part of it. And the, the anticipation, the eager anticipation of Jesus coming for his bride and us getting to spend eternity with him. And it's like, that was always just such a positive thing. And it's only been in recent years that that's kind of flipped a little bit. And churches just don't talk about it that much. Um, but I will say that in the last few years, as I've dug in and just seen what Scripture does say and doesn't say, I found my interpretations shifting and to be what to me feels like more in line with the actual words in the book. And I, I just, I, I all the time hear people say something and they'll say, well, this happens. And I'm like, well, the, 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 what you're talking about, it doesn't say that. You can infer that, but it doesn't say that. And so I'm, I'm trying to drill down just into what the words say. Do they have a point of reference to something in the Old Testament? Is there something that you can look at that would undergird your understanding of what's really being said? 
Um, and if something is can be interpreted in a, a couple of different ways, come at it from that perspective, not just that, no, it's this. Um, and and I, I mean, that just, yeah, that, that's just kind of where I'm at. And, and that's where this, this study is kind of going. And that's kind of the, again, the perspective that I hold um, in terms of how I, how I study and how I, um, how I try to interpret things, especially from a timing perspective. But so the two witnesses take place in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11 is what, what I call um, a parenthetical chapter. And what I mean by that is I, I believe 100% that um, Revelation is chronological with some caveats. Um, by and large, it is, um, it is chronological. However, you have stories that are told, like specific stories that are told, and in order for you to get to the point of the story, you have to be given backstory. And that backstory obviously stretches back um, before the point of that story, if that, if that makes sense. So, um, for example, the two witnesses, really the point of the story is, um, and, and is, is, is kind of transitional, really. It's, it's part of a transition from the first half of the three and a half year um, period of the tribulation, the day of the Lord, whatever you want to call it, um, into the second half. And because we have the introduction of the beast um, who is talked about in Revelation 13. And Revelation uh, 13, cl very clearly, the point of that is uh, a midpoint. And, and there's, there, there's just some unmistakable clues in here that this, this takes place, the story of the two witnesses takes place over the course of the first three and a half years. And then things, again, things shift and we start looking toward um, events at the midpoint and then pushing beyond that. So here's what it says in um, Revelation 11. And I just wanna make sure I'm not skipping anything here. Um, we're just going to read this, and then we're going to go back and, and kind of pick up some things and and dissect some things. Revelation 11 says this, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it, is, because it has given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. So that's 11, 1 and 2. So here you have a 42-month period, which is three and a half years in, in terms of biblical uh, years, which is 360 years. So uh, 42 months is, is the same thing. So that's how you, people say, it's like, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say that, I have actually heard people say the Bible doesn't say there will be a temple uh, rebuilt. It's like, well, there you go. Revelation 11, 1 and 2, um, there, there will be a temple. Um, but it does not have to be built. It just has to be functioning by the time that, um, built and functioning by the time of uh, uh, the, the, the Antichrist setting up the abomination of desolation that, at the midpoint. Uh, so anyway, and now, so that's the temple. Now, it's, now it talks about the two witnesses, and it says, and I will give, uh, pick it up in verse 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. 1260 days, again, another way of saying three and a half years. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men will have the power will have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to... Sorry. <sighs> I am tired, so it, there may be a few of those. <laughs> Sorry about that. They have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they have finished their testimony... 
after 1260 days, because remember we're told they will prophesy for 1260 days, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Um, unpack a little bit of that in the um, uh, Who is Mystery Babylon video from a, a video or two ago. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half, but after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here, and they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people, people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So, that's the story of the two witnesses. So much in there. But here's, here's kind of where the rubber hits the road. I covered this before in um, a video about who is the great multitude. Um, we touched on this. But um, the traditional view would say that the martyrs that are seen under the altar at the opening of the fifth seal in Revelation 6 are tribulation saints. That the two witnesses and 144,000 are uh, you know, ministering the gospel throughout the world, and there's this untold, uncountable number that... Um, that that end up in Revelation seven, but that they're um, uh, but they're coming out in at the fifth seal, which is there. There's just, I mean, just from a, a practical standpoint, you have to really get kind of bendy with the the chronology of things in order for like the ministry of the hundred forty four thousand to be producing. Um, uh, all of these martyrs in this um, greatest revival ever seen, um, uh, according to what it says in, in Revelation 7 about the great multitude that appears in heaven. But um, you have the, the martyrs under the altar appearing before the 144,000 are even sealed, and then you have the, hundred and, uh, then you have this, the martyrs under the altar uh, before the great multitude appears in white robes uh, in further on in chapter seven. So there's like, the, it just doesn't line up from a time standpoint. Um, on the one hand, you've got them suddenly appearing in Revelation chapter seven, but then you've got them already under the altar in the fifth seal. And, and I think that I have a hard time saying that they can be the resultant, um, uh, I'm too much of a, I guess, a literalist and, 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 and adhere to kind of a chronological understanding of Revelation to understand that th these are martyrs from the tribulation that are kind of being produced by the witness, uh, the two witnesses or the 144,000 when we've not heard anything about the 144,000 yet or the two witnesses. Um, and so, but it does beg the question. Um, number one, as we, as we talked about in the Great Multitude video, 144,000, um, we're not told that they have a ministry. Um, we're told that they are sealed and that they are protected from um, some of the judgments, the, specifically the, the fifth seal, or the, I'm sorry, the fifth trumpet, um, which are the demonic locust creatures that come out of the earth. Uh, we're told that specifically that the 144,000 are protected from that. Um, and then we see them in heaven, but we're never told um, what they what they do. We are told that they are servants of God, um, but it's it says uh, in Revelation seven 
three, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees till we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. So they're servants of God, and we know that they're Jewish, but we're never told that they have a message at all. Um, so then it kind of boils down to, okay, so, well, but the two witnesses, they, they're, they're witnesses, and they prophesy. So um, surely they're just telling people to repent, and everyone is... Are, Every, the logic would be that everyone is responding because of all of the, you know, the freaky judgments that are going on, that it, it, it would underscore and give credence to their testimony. However, um, we're told they have a testimony in uh, Revelation eleven seven says when they have finished their testimony. Okay, so we know that for 1260 days, but we're not told what the testimony is. Um, we're told that they prophesy. We're not told what they prophesy about. Um, but, so we're not told really anything they say beyond that they prophesy. So, let's start to unpack this a bit. Um, uh, get rid of the spinning beach ball on my computer and pull up the window. Here we go. There you go. Thanks for playing. <laughs> um, so, and I tell you, once you start getting into some of this stuff, like commentaries can be, um, not as helpful as you'd like, um, because there's just so much disagreement and there's so, I, I'm really surprised actually, um, that some of the commentaries, even some that I, I typically think are pretty solid and kind of line up with, with how I approach, um, understanding things in Revelation, man, some of them are just so uh, highly symbolic that it's really super clear that these are two people. Um, but it's, I, I've, I, I've seen commentaries that it's like it's the Old and the New Testament, or it's, um, you know, it's the church and, you know, something else. It's like, um, no, you don't kill like the church and you don't, you know, like the New Testament, the Old Testament doesn't lie in the street for three and a half days. I mean, there's just, again, I believe Revelation is literal until it can't be. Uh, I've used that, um, uh, the example of the, the, the wine press, you know, at, at the harvest of the earth in Revelation chapter 14. I've heard people say that there's literally going to be blood that comes up to the horse's bridles for like 1600 stadia. Like I, I looked that up once. It's, it's like a huge amount of land. And so, but it says that it flows out of the wine press up the, up to that height. So if you believe that there's literally going to be blood that high for that long a distance, then you have to believe that it's literally flowing out of a wine press. Um, and I don't believe there's going to be a literal wine press that people are thrown into. I think that clearly is figurative language, talking about the judgment of God as it's poured out at the very end in the bowl judgments. So, um, but I think this is like, I don't think there's any reason to kind of like overlay and shoehorn in some, some uh, metaphorical, allegorical kind of uh, symbolism here because it it just it is it just makes so much more sense to, and from a literal standpoint. So uh, um, let's look at that. I want to look at a, a few words and just kind of so that we get a, an understanding of what is really being said here. What what are the what do these words mean? So the first I want to look at is um, the word uh, witness. We're told that um, I will give power uh, to my two witnesses. Uh, some translations don't have the word power. It just says, I will give to my two witnesses. Um, but uh, power is the word uh, martus. It is Strong's Greek 3144. The definition is a witness. The usage is a witness, an eyewitness, or ear witness. Um, and there are a couple of different ways that this can be looked at. Um, one is in a legal sense, and one is in... Um, a historical sense. Um, so, 
uh, it doesn't necessarily mean like we hear witness. I think a lot of times, at least if you grew up, um, I grew up like I, I went to Baptist churches when I was a kid um, and uh, as a young adult. And when you, a witness was to tell your testimony, to give your testimony. We hear words like witness and testimony, and we think that means that they're telling people to get saved, that they're telling people how to get saved. And um, is that what's going on? I, I don't think so. Um, and for a, a myriad of reasons, um, Myriad might be a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> several reasons. We'll go with several. Very different than Myriad, dude. Um, but uh, so I'm going to circle back around here to this idea of a witness um, because that, that has some interesting connotations. And I, I think we're going to maybe start to get a little bit of a different picture here. So witness just means like eyewitness or ear witness. Um, it says in, from a historical sense, um, it says... Uh, one who testifies for another, to be a witness for one, to serve him by testimony. He is said to be a witness to whose attestation appeal is made, um, or in the case of how it's used here, the faithful interpreters of God's counsels are called God's witnesses. And so, uh, so that's kind of what that word is. And it says that they will prophesy for 1260 days. And we looked at this before, but the... Um, uh, that word is Strong's 4395, which is propheteuo, propheteuo, and it, the definition is to foretell, to tell forth, or prophesy. The usage is I foretell, prophesy, I set forth matter of divine teaching by special faculty. In the Helps Word Studies, it says properly to speak forth in divinely empowered forthtelling or foretelling. Prophecy. In the New Testament, prophesy occurs 28 times, usually a forth telling, which reveals the mind or message of God in a particular situation. Uh, it can also refer to foretelling, uh, predicting the future as the Lord reveals it. So the, the idea that they're prophesying is the idea that they are telling what's coming. Um, so... Here's, the, here's the, the, as my grandma used to say, here's the $64 question. Um, is what's coming, what they would be prophesying about, is what's coming, um, like grace and mercy, or is what's coming judgment and retribution and um, wrath? And, and I think it's the latter. Um, so the question then becomes, does, um, does prophesying always have to include or, or must it include a warning to repent? Because that's really kind of what we're getting to here, right? We know that there are prophets, uh, prophets in the Old Testament and that they carried some pretty um, heavy-duty messages, um, messages of judgment. And so I think we have this understanding that there's this, um, there's a call to repentance attached to that. Um, I've even heard, I've even heard it said that, that um, Jonah preached repentance to Nineveh. If you go back and look at what's there, you might could imply it could infer that, but that's not what it says. Um, let's look at Jonah just real quick, just as an example. Um, when Jonah finally, you know, gets you know tucked up out of the whale, <laughs> washes himself off, and goes to Nineveh, um, look at what it says, uh, Jonah three. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. So we have to assume then that if he obeyed the Lord, he's going to be giving the message that God has told him to give. Did God tell him to tell him to repent? Look what it says. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, 
Jonah started into, on the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's it. That's his message. Um, that's all we're told that Jonah says. For all we know, um, what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight words. That, that's an eight word sermon over and over for the time that Jonah's in Nineveh. But look what it says. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. So there's, there's um, signs of mourning and of affliction of the soul, um, which is kind of a sackcloth is indicative of. It can be indicative of repentance as well. But like they do repent, but it's of their own. It's not because there was a, there was a, uh, a message. Now, is it possible that Jonah included a message, a call to repent? It's possible. Is it likely? I don't know. I don't, I kind of don't think so because we know that God, you know, they, you know, they, they call uh, the, the king issues a proclamation and that they're going to like, they're going to fast. Um, they're, they're put, everybody's putting on sackcloth. They're throwing sackcloth on their animals. It's like, um, and that's not a joke. Um, chapter or verse eight, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. I mean, like they're serious. They're, they believe the word that what they believe God is that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. That's what they believe. And they believe this man came from God. So they're, so they're putting two and two together on their own and saying, we need to get our stuff together and get right with this God who's going to destroy us. So, um, but, excuse me, look what happens. God saw, God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But look at the next verse. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. So since Jonah did not want them to repent, and we know that from, from the rest of this story, I mean, he even says, oh, Lord, is this not what I said while I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. He's like, he didn't want any part of the love of God being shown to the Ninevites. And like, look, that Nineveh, well-documented, um, horrific, horrible city, and well-known for um, their brutality. But so the idea that Jonah is that we would be told that we would be told in the pages of scripture that he says that Jonah says 40 more days and then will be overturned to assume that he's saying also, but we're not told, but, that, but kind of that, that, that he's saying, so come, to, so return to God so that you can get right and avoid this. I, that, that's not part of his message. I just don't think that, I don't know how you could make a case for that um, because he's upset. He would not be, he doesn't want them to come to repentance. Um, that much is clear. So, so the idea that, uh, that Jonah would preach that is the case. But what about like others? Are there other instances um, where we see um, prophecy without a call to repentance? And that's what we're going to look at. And I've got uh, several I'm going to hit up here. So we're going to look at um, a, a couple in Jeremiah, and then we're just going to stick in the book of Ezekiel. And, and honestly, this is one of those day of the Lord studies, man. I could have like gone back and, and dug up a whole lot of mo, but um, I'm going to have a lot for you. And and, um, and then I'm going to, we're going to look at some in Isaiah, and I'm not even going to, like, I'm going to read the ones from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I'm not even going to read the ones from Isaiah because uh, we'll be here all night long. And like I said, I'm tired and eventually I'm run out of tea. You know, <laughs> that, that means it's time for bed. So, so here we go, man. Let's roll. Jeremiah, let me hop back there. Jeremiah 14 is where we're going to look at first. If you want to go with me. That's why, I, you know, I like my paper Bible, man. Because uh, I can hear them pages turning. I don't hear that when I'm flipping through screens, my computer. Um, Jeremiah 14, 
<clears throat> and we're going to look at 11 through 12 first. Um, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for the well-being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with sword, famine, and plague. Now, I, I did a, a video quite a while back. It's in the Revelation 6 playlist um, that really unpacks the Old Testament uh, uh, appearance of the, the, the riders on the colored horses. That's not a, an exclusively Revelation uh, concept that and kind of what they are, what they represent, and and these four judgments of God that we see in the the four horsemen of of Revelation. We see them in Zechariah. Um, there's one other place I'm drawing a blank on where that is, but um, uh, but anyway. So and actually, I just thought of something. I want to check this. I have had. I'm, I kid you not. I have so many things that the Lord keeps showing me that they're kind of crossing over. And um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is really interesting, but it's not for today. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I don't think so. Um, I'm trying to remember what this was relevant to, what I was going to, where I was going to bring this up. Nope, just not going to do it today. <laughs> so, too much else to cover. But look at this verse. What, what does he say? The Lord said to me, do not pray for the well-being of this people. Because when God has determined that judgment is next up on, for, for, for who he's determined to bring the judgment against, that's what his intention is. And, and look what he says. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And boy, there's, uh, as we've talked about, that would talk about an eye opener for me. Just that, that whole piece um, uh, in Revelation 8 with the offering of the incense and how that is um, tied to, uh, what is it, it's Leviticus 16? 16 or 13, I always get it mixed up. I think it's 16. Um, uh, yeah, Leviticus 16. But it's the, it's specifically tied to the offering of incense uh, that's part of the Day of Atonement. But there's this whole idea that, um, that you know, there's burnt offerings, grain offerings, that's a, that's a part of the Day, day of Atonement. Um, but that, that God doesn't accept it. And when you look at Revelation 8, it's very clear that he doesn't accept that. Um, Anyway, too many rabbit holes and rabbit trails and other things to do with rabbits that I don't want to get going down. Um, but the, the, the point of all that is um, God's intention is to destroy the, the people he's talking about here. And so let's look at, continue on though, and look at 13, we'll go 13 through 18. The rest of this, it says, but I said, ah, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Instead, I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by the sword and famine. And the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and sword. There will be no one to bury them or their wives, their sons, or their daughters. I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. Like... Dude, <laughs> um, speak this word to them. Let my eyes overflow with tears night and day without ceasing. For my virgin daughter, my people, have suffered a grievous wound, a crushing blow. If I go into the, into the country, I see those slain by the sword. If I go into the city, I see the ravages of famine. 
both prophet and priest have gone to a land they know not. So, um, very, very interesting. Um, there's not, um, there's not a call to repentance here. There's prophecy, for sure. Um, and then there's a condemnation against the prophets who are speaking otherwise, uh, except what that they're, they're, these people are saying, no, there's going to be peace. And then he's like, um, no, there's not. So, um, let's look at, uh, 15, um, one, one through one through nine, uh, kind of continuing. It says, then the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to this people. Send them away from my presence. Let them go. And if they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death to death, those for the sword to the sword, those for starvation to starvation, those for captivity to captivity. If that sounds familiar, that is most definitely a foreshadowing of what we see happening in Revelation 13 with the rise of the Antichrist and with the rise of the false prophet. Um, it says about the Antichrist, this beast that comes out of the sea. It says in uh, Revelation 13, um, let's start in verse 7. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. Like, straight out of Jeremiah 15. Just so you know, that's God in Jeremiah 15. That's God's words saying this. And so I believe when you have this offset the way it is, um, this is like, I think these are, this is God's intention of judgment um, as, a, as a component of it. Um, and we'll, we'll look at, I uh, could just continue, like, look at this. This is brutal stuff. Um, verse 4, I will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth because of what Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did in Jerusalem. Who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Who will mourn for you? Who will stop and ask how you are? You have rejected me, declares the Lord. You keep on backsliding. So I will lay hands on you and destroy you. I can no longer show compassion. I will winnow them with a winnowing fork at the city gates of the land. I will bring bereavement and destruction on my people, for they have not changed their ways. I will make their widows more numerous than the sand of the sea. At midday, I will bring a destroyer against the mothers of their young men. Suddenly, I will bring down on them anguish and terror. The mother of seven will grow faint and breathe her last. Her sun will set while it is still day. She will be disgraced and humiliated. I will put the survivors to the sword before their enemies. I mean, this is shades of day of the Lord stuff. And a lot of this stuff we, we touched there as well. However, um, the point is that... I mean, I've heard people say that, like, um, because God is a God of love and a God of compassion and a God of grace, that the he, his, his desire is to get people saved during this, this, this time that the two witnesses are prophesying. And I, I disagree. There is a day coming that God has set aside for the punishment of his enemies. And it, the, it, it, the Bible is just abundantly clear. It will come upon the whole earth. That is the day of the Lord. And it is not, at that point, God's program, it's not that God is no longer compassionate or loving or merciful um, or full of grace. He is, but that is no longer his program at this time. At this time... When the two witnesses are prophesying, they are prophesying in the midst of a program of 
vengeance and wrath and retribution, not a period of grace. If you want grace, come to Jesus now because this is the time of grace. The, the, after, the, it, after the rapture of the church, the day of the Lord begins and um, I got hours and hours of day of the Lord material. If, you're, if, if you didn't see it, it's rough stuff and it is hard. Um, it, 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 is, it, it can bring you to tears if you understand how thorough um, it is. It, it's really, it's, it's just beyond what, what you think. Um, so, um, I, I just don't, the words of the Lord, you know, um, I, I will not show compassion. Um, I can no longer show, I will lay hands on you and destroy you. I can no longer show compassion. Um, I will bring bereavement and destruction. Um, it's, there's a day coming, friends, and it's, it's not a time of, the day of the Lord is not a time of mercy and grace. Those are rewards that are given to the righteous during the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord, it's, it's two things. We've talked about this over and over. It's a time of separation, righteous from unrighteous, reward for the righteous, wrath for those that are not included in the former group. Um, and I say it that way because we, we tend to think, um, our default, I think as, as people with hearts that care is that, well, so-and-so is not really an enemy of God, but because they don't hate God, they just haven't placed faith in Jesus. Like, I'm sorry, man, but the rapture is the dividing line. Once you, if you don't go in the rapture, you're left whether you're whether God considers you an enemy or not, you're left to face what comes down on His enemies, um, because it is really abundantly clear in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, that this is coming on the whole earth. So, um, we'll look at one more in Jeremiah twenty-five. Um, Twenty-five, twenty-nine through thirty-eight. Look at this, man. Um, twenty-nine through thirty-eight, and this is part of uh, this whole section. We talked about this. I think it was last time about the cup of God's wrath. Maybe it was two videos ago. Uh, the cup of God's wrath in uh, Jeremiah twenty-five. In twenty-nine. It says this. Um, See, I am beginning to bring disaster on the city that bears my name, and you, and you. And will you indeed go unpunished? So in other words, what he's saying, he's, he's just, this is, um, Jeremiah's been told to um, take the cup of God's wrath and take it to these nations that he's prophesying against. And um, and he's basically saying, I'm getting ready to bring the hammer down on Jerusalem and you think you're going to escape? Don't think so. Um, will you indeed go unpunished? You will not go unpunished for I am calling down a sword Upon all who live on the earth, declares the Lord Almighty. Now prophesy all these words against them and say to them. So again, prophesying. The lion will roar from on high. He will thunder from his holy dwelling and roar mightily against his land. He will shout like those who tread the grapes. That's Revelation 14 in the wine press of God's wrath. Um Shout against all who live on the earth. The tumult will resound to the ends of the earth, for the Lord will bring charges against the nations. Sorry. He will bring judgment on all mankind and put the wicked to the sword. Look, disaster is spreading from nation to nation. A mighty storm is rising from the ends of the earth. At that time, those slain by the Lord will be everywhere from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be mourned or gathered up or buried, but they will be like refuse lying on the ground. And then it goes on, you know, weep and wail shepherds, and it, it, it goes on. I'll, I'll cut that a little bit short. But the idea is, this is a massive prophecy against all the nations and against all the earth. Nary a call to repentance in there. It is prophecy without the call. Um, it's prophecy that 
this is show enough going to happen. And y'all are on the business end of it. And it's coming. Um, so let's look at Ezekiel. Uh, we're just going to jump there. Those are the ones I wanted to hit in Jeremiah. But Ezekiel, um, quite a few here. We'll look at Ezekiel. And I'm going to bounce around because I, I look some things up and I just... They, they are not in order, so if you're following along in your Bible, and I do recommend you do, so you can make some notes and all, but we're going to start in Ezekiel 25, but we're going to go back and forth in the book. So again, sorry. Hello, man. I need to go quick, because I'm, I'm going to be on it a whole lot more, and that's pretty uncool. So, um, uh, Ezekiel... I said 25, and I was looking at Jeremiah 25. Sorry. Sorry, man. It's late. Ezekiel 11. Sorry, guys. 11. Uh, 4 through 12. Uh, Ezekiel 11, 4 through 12. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, son of man. Uh, no, prophesy, son of man. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon me and told me what to say. Told me to say, this is what the Lord says. This is what you are saying, O house of Israel, but I know what is going through your mind. You have killed many people in this city and filled its streets with the dead. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. The bodies you have thrown there are the meat and the city is the pot, but I will drive you out of it. You fear the sword and the sword is what I will bring. Oh man, all the yawning is making my eyes water. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and the sword is what I will bring against you, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will drive you out of the city and hand you over to foreigners and inflict punishment on you. You will fall by the sword and I will execute judgment on you at the borders of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Um, the city will not be a pot for you, nor will there be any meat in it. Um, I will execute judgment on you at the borders of Israel, and you will know that I am the Lord. Um, for you have not followed my decrees or kept my laws, but have conformed to the standards of the nations around you. Prophecy without a call to repentance. Um, the message is judgment's coming. And again, not a call to repentance in the, in, in the mix. Um, Ezekiel 6, a few pages over. Sorry. 1 through 10. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against the mountains of Israel, prophesy against them, and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys. I'm about to bring a sword against you and I will destroy your high places. Your altars will be demolished and your incense altars will be smashed. And I will slay your people in front of your idols. I will lay the dead bodies of the Israelites in front of their idols and I will scatter your bones around the altars. Wherever you live, the towns will be laid waste and the high places demolished so that your altars will be laid waste and devastated. Your altars, your idols smashed and ruined. Your incense altars broken down and what you have made wiped out. Your people will fall slain among you and you will know that I am the Lord. But I will spare some of you for you will escape the sword when you are scattered among the lands and, and, and nations. And in the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escape will remember me, how I have been grieved by their adulterous hearts, which, uh, which have turned away from me, and by their eyes, which have lusted after idols. They will loathe themselves for the evil they have done and for all the detest detestable practices. And they will know that I am the Lord. I did not threaten in vain to bring this calamity on them. <laughs> so... Lest you think that sounds like mercy on one hand it is, but like it, it's not that the prophecy is without mercy because prophecies about Israel, for example, are that, uh, that there is mercy shown to Israel because he even says uh, in, in, in at least a few places that I will destroy you, but I will not destroy you fully or completely. 
And that's kind of what you're getting here. Like there will be some that escape, but you're going into captivity. Um, but again, judgment, some spared, but no call to repentance in the prophecy. And notice how it says prophesy against. Um, so many of these are prophesy against. Um, and when we look at the two witnesses, it says they will prophesy. And so we think that like, again, we, we read all sorts of things into that, but like the Old Testament prophecies were against a nation or against a group. Um, so uh, there is an Ezekiel 25. How about that? So we can go to Ezekiel 25 now. There's a few down. Um, Ezekiel 25, two through seven. Son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to them, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you said, aha, over my sanctuary when it was desecrated and over the land of Israel when it was laid waste and over the people of Judah when they went into exile, therefore I am going to give you to the people of the east as a possession. They will set up their camps and pitch their tents among you. They will eat your fruit and drink your milk. I will turn Rabbah into a pasture for camels and Ammon into a resting place for sheep. Then you will know that I am the Lord. How far am I going here? It's okay, uh, two more. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet, rejoicing with all the malice of your heart against the land of Israel, therefore I will stretch out my hand against you and give you as plunder to the nations. I will cut you off from the nations and exterminate you from the countries. I will destroy you and you will know that I am the Lord. Unless you repent. It don't say that. Um, it's, I will destroy you and you will know that I am the Lord. That's what it's like for the word of the Lord to come as a prophecy against um, a nation. Again, judgment, no call to repentance. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 20 through 23. Uh, 28 to 20 through 23. Boy, we're going to come back and, um, and hit Ezekiel in another study. Uh, 20, like what is it? 27 and 28. Because, oof, there's some, there's some stuff there that's going to blow your mind. Um, Ezekiel 28, 20 through 23. Uh, this is prophecy against Sidon. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Sidon, prophesy against her. And say, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Sidon, and I will gain glory within you. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I inflict punishment on her and show myself holy within her. I will send a plague upon her and make blood flow in her streets. The slain will fall within her with a sword against her on every side. They Then they will know that I am the Lord. Um Rough stuff. Um, prophecy against this nation, no call to repentance at all. Um, and so I just made this connection. And, I, I, you know, if I'd made it early, I would probably put it off until later. But, like, I, I find this pretty fascinating. I, I had not noticed this till just now. But um, you see the pattern here, right? It's, you know, son of man, set your face against this nation prophesy against them. So there's a prophecy, but it's not like to bring repentance. It's a prophecy against them. You're foretelling what's going to happen. Um, but then uh, look at how many times it ends with, then they will know that I am the Lord. The point of the prophecy, the point of bringing the destruction is so that people will know I am the Lord. Look at what happens in, in Revelation uh, 11. We, we know we looked at in the, uh, the, the Mystery Babylon video about that um, this, this great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified, being Jerusalem. Um, and then there's an earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. So the tenth of the city would still be Jerusalem. And so we're still talking about the Jews. The 7,000 were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Very interesting. 
That's the first time that we see that reaction because, as we talked about before, when the trumpet judgments are unleashed, it doesn't bring repentance. It brings, or it doesn't even bring an acknowledgement of God. It brings further rebellion. But now, um, when we see this going down uh, and, and the prophecy has come to pass, that whatever they're doing, it's, it's, it's done. And I believe it's um, some of the things, well, it's clear. Some of the things they're talking about, they're, they're also causing to happen um, and bringing about. And we'll look at that in a minute. But um, you look at this and uh, it's the same, uh, the same result as these other prophecies. They will know that I am the Lord. Um, that's, that's what we see as the result of the prophecy in Revelation 11. So interesting. Uh, we'll look at Ezekiel, uh, 35, uh, 35, and I'm not going to read all this. I have written down to read all this. Um, <laughs> um, I'm just going to read a, a bit of it here. The word of the Lord came to me. This is a prophecy against Edom. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Mount Sire, prophesy against it and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Mount Sair, uh, and I will stretch out my hand against you and make you a desolate waste. I will turn your towns into ruins and you will be desolate. Then you will know that I am the Lord because you harbored an ancient hostility and delivered the Israelites over to the sword at the time of their calamity, the time their punishment reached its climax. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will give you over to bloodshed, and it will pursue you. Since you did not hate bloodshed, bloodshed will pursue you. I will make Mount Seir a desolate waste and cut off from it all who come and go. I will fill your mountains with the slain. Those killed by the sword will fall on the hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines. I will make you desolate forever. Your towns will not be inhabited, then you will know that I am the Lord. And I'm, I could go on, but the, the rest of what I'm reading, you can go read it, read the rest of chapter 35 for yourself. There's not a call to repentance in there. Judgment, massive, rough, brutal, and no call to repentance. Uh, Ezekiel 20. Flipping back, I told you we'd flip back and forth. And I, my notes are written down in my journal. So um, if it was, if I'd done this digitally, of course I could have reordered some things and made this go a little smoother. But um, I did this uh, analog, baby, uh, <laughs> actual paper. Ezekiel 20, we're going to look at uh, verse 44. I'm sorry, no, 45 through 49, prophecy against the south. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forests of the southland. Say to the southern forest, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am about to set fire to you. <clears throat> and it will consume all your trees, both green and dry. The blazing flame will not be quenched and every face from north to south will be scorched by it. Everyone will see that I, the Lord, have kindled it and it will not be quenched. Um, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a prophecy of judgment that's coming. And boy, we see, sure, sure to see shades of the trumpet judgments in that, um, even the bold judgments with the sun scorching people. Um, so we, we, lots of these things have types and shadows and we see them playing out and even some of the same language being used in Revelation, because in Revelation, it's like day of the Lord. It's a lot of these prophecies have components that point to the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord, I'm telling you, it is a big deal. It is the thing that the believers look forward to because of uh, that we are kept from wrath. I, you know, um, I am a total 100% pre-tribulation rapture person. The, the amount of times I have to say that is just sad. <laughs> um, I've had people feeling like they've got to warn 
uh, other other believers that that I you know uh, hey you know I don't you know I don't have a traditional view of the timing of things and so uh, I'm not pre-trib I am 100% pre-trib I believe the trib happens when the Bible says it happens because I believe the tribulation what people commonly refer to as the tribulation what I've always referred to as the tribulation is the day of the Lord and um, so it's it just makes sense that a lot of these passages where we see um, allusions. Um, and and uh, this this kind of judgment, uh, it has very much day of the Lord connotations because the expectation that there is a day that God has set aside um, t to open up a can of it on everyone else that is um, that's that's not been separated out for reward. Uh, Ezekiel twenty one, uh, Babylon, God's sort of judgment. Um, again, I, I, I want to. I mean, it, it, it's. It goes on and on and on. The word of the Lord uh, came to me, Son of man, set your face against Jerusalem and priests against the sanctuary. Prophesy against the land of Israel and say to her, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you. I will draw my sword from its scabbard and cut from you both the righteous and the wicked because I am going to cut off the righteous and the wicked. My sword will be unsheathed against everyone from north to south. Then all people will know that I am the Lord, that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword from its scabbard. It will not return again. Therefore, groan, son of man, groan before them with a broken heart and bitter grief. And when they ask you, why are you groaning? You shall say, because of the news that is coming. Every heart will melt and every hand go limp. Every spirit will become faint and every knee become weak as water. It is coming. It will surely take place, declares the Sovereign Lord. Um, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, this is what the Lord says, a sword, a sword, sharpened and polished, sharpened for the slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Um, interesting that the coming of Jesus is to told to be uh, one that comes like lightning as well. And we know, of course, he has a sword uh, that comes out of his mouth that destroys his enemies at his truce at his second coming um, at the end of Revelation. Um, anyway, it goes it goes on for a lot more. That's like up through verse ten, and it that chapter um, that I had all of it. It goes on till verse thirty two. I mean, you know, just look at how it ends. Um, you know, in verse 31, I will pour out my wrath upon you and breathe out my fiery anger against you. I will hand you over to brutal men, men skilled in destruction. You will be fuel for the fire. Your blood will be shed in your land. You will be remembered no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken. Um, this prophecy, man, it is not just, um, you know, repent, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's, no, it's, this is bad news. It's the judgment of God, and it's coming, and it is sure enough going to come. Um, just a couple more here. Ezekiel 29. Um, prophecy against Egypt. Um, I, you know what? I'm already at uh, an hour and 18 minutes. I'm going to probably just wrap it up. I could go, I could go on, but I, I'm just going to give you some. Uh, Ezekiel 29 and 30, both chapters are about Egypt, both include prophecies against them, um, and, uh, and a lament for them, and even uh, Ezekiel 30, that very much has some day of the Lord connotations, how this ultimately gets fulfilled, because Ezekiel 30, it says, um, this is what the sovereign Lord says, wail and say, alas for that day, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near, um, uh, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come against Egypt and anguish against Cush. So again, uh, the, you know, I will set fire to Egypt, fire a massive component. So again, there's this idea that there's this judgment that's coming in the near term, but in the future, um, ultimate fulfillment at the day of the Lord. And again, in both of these chapters, judgment without a call to repentance. We see the same thing in Ezekiel 38, 39, prophecies against Gog and Magog. Um, a lot of Bible prophecy students would be familiar with those chapters. Um, look through those and see where Gog is asked to repent. It's not. Um, 
uh, Ezekiel 13, uh, uh, prophecies um, against false prophets of peace. We looked at that earlier, I think. Um, but again, uh, no call to repentance. Um, and then, and then just, just for grins, I wrote, I wrote these down just, uh, from Isaiah. Um, go look these up if you want. Isaiah, uh, chapter 13 through 14, uh, prophecies against Babylon, no call to repentance. Isaiah 15 through 16, prophecies against Moab, no call to repentance. Isaiah 17, a prophecy against Damascus, no call to repentance. Isaiah 18, a prophecy against Cush, no call to repentance. Isaiah 19, a prophecy against Egypt, no call to repentance. Uh, Isaiah 20, against Egypt and Cush both, um, no call to repentance. Isaiah 21, Babylon and Edom, no call to repentance. Isaiah 22, Jerusalem, no call to repentance. And Isaiah 23, a prophecy against Tyre, no call to repentance. Prophecy that judgment is coming, not a single call to repentance. So I have a really hard time, friends, in Revelation 11, when I see that they're prophesying for 1260 days, and that there's to and and, and I have a hard time reading into this text that there's a message of repentance when we're not told there's one. And as a matter of fact, we're told just the opposite. We're not told what they say. And when we look at this word prophecy or prophesied, and we looked at that, um, a couple of commentaries just brought out some points that I thought were pretty, pretty good. Um, the Expositor's Greek Testament just says this very simple thing. Um, the function of the two witnesses is defined as prophecy, but no details are given. And like that really doesn't um, that doesn't sit well with other commentators. <laughs> this uh, from Ellicott's commentary for English readers, and I, I've, I've really liked some of the things that I found in uh, the Ellicott commentary. But uh, this, like, they don't even, they don't know what to do with it. Um, the witnesses prophesy. The word prophesy must surely be allowed a much wider meaning than merely to predict or foretell future events. So, like, why? I mean, I unless you're trying to, to to get it back to a great multitude coming out of their their time that they're 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 witnessing, unless you're trying to make those two things fit, there's nothing here that would indicate that their prophesying is different than the prophesying against nations in the Old Testament. And as a matter of fact, the the context even. Um, even bears that out. Look at look at this. Um, look at these two things, and I'm not even going to get into this. Um, uh, the 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 uh, chapter four, or verse four that these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. I, I'm just going to say that that is a reference to Zechariah uh, chapter four. You can go read that, and um, and that talks about. Um, uh, the, the lamp stands, it talks about the, um, the olive trees, uh, the olive branches rather that provide oil for the lamps. Um, so you can go read that and unpack that. I don't, uh, I just don't want to take up the time for that, but, but that's in there. But, um, look at what these, look at what these guys do. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and devours their enemies. Um, this is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have the power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. This doesn't sound like a feel-good, friendly message. And it doesn't sound like, what, like I said, we don't know what their message is, but we can see what they do. This, what their actions would seem to indicate is not one of, um, of an extension of grace, but rather an extension of the judgment of God that has already begun getting poured out. Um, look at this, for example, just 
Um, look at these parallels. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. Well, what's the first things that happen uh, when after the seventh seal is open? We see this um, offering of incense that we talked about earlier, but uh, you know the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. So there's judgment through fire. Um, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. So like a secondary thing. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So references to, you know, the very allusions to what we talked about earlier um, with the judgment from fire. But like, so there's this fire that is very clearly connected with the judgment of God. And that's what comes out of their mouths to destroy any anyone who wants to destroy them. Um, look at this. They have the power to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague. Um, what do we see? Um, uh, um, in the bold judgments is that the waters turn to blood. Um, didn't have that out, ready to go. Oops, here we go, sorry. There it is. Um, I think it's the is it fifth? No, 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 what is it? Oh, no, it's the, the third. Third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Uh, the second angel poured his uh, bowl out on the sea, and it turned to blood, um, like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. So, like, there's uh, things that they're doing are extensions. They seem to be extensions of the judgment of God upon the earth. Um, the parallels are just too, too similar to, to really ignore. And, and so, and when they die, you know, people don't mourn, they celebrate. Why do they celebrate? It says they will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. Again, I don't see a message of repentance in here. I think these guys are... They are saying what's coming, and they are instruments of God to bring it about. Um, that, that's how I see that. Um, and, and I think that's God's intention. Again, we're not in a program of grace at this point. We're in a program of judgment and of wrath. God is still a, a God of grace and a God of love and of mercy, but like that's not the program at this time. Um, uh, look back to, uh, just just for uh, just a, a, another kind of component of this. I, I want to look at Isaiah 6 because this is really interesting, I think. Um, just because it's interesting to me, don't mean it will be interesting to you, but um, I kind of think it will be. Look at Isaiah 6, and we're going to look at like Isaiah's um, commission. This is really interesting how this fits with this theme here. Um, Look at how Isaiah is commissioned by God. Um, in verse 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Like, God's intention in anointing and commissioning Isaiah to prophesy was so that their hearts would be hardened. The people who listened would harden their hearts and would not turn and be healed, but would go into the judgment that they had brought upon themselves by rejecting and being unfaithful to God and by all that they did to, against God's people. Um, pretty, pretty fascinating that the, 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 the whole purpose of the commission is so that they won't repent is what it seems. Um, 
clearly judgment is in God's mind and not repentance. And then when it, when Isaiah continues and he says, then I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without habit lie ruined and without inhabitant until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. Um, and then, then there's a, an idea that like far future, uh, but as the terebinth and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. So, like, there's still this idea that there's a remnant that's not totally destroyed, but everything else is like God, he says, well, how long do I give this message? Um, and he says, until judgments come. Until I have executed my judgment. Again, judgment is in his mind. Um, the Lord has a day in store, my friends. Um, so, I just want to look at, so that, that kind of gets me to, the idea that these are two witnesses. And we talked about that earlier, how that witnessing and testimonies and things like that give us this idea of a message of repentance and um, and, and all of that business. So um, the idea of a testimony, and someone had pointed this out to me, and I thought this was pretty interesting. There are... Oh, I am so sorry, guys. Man, alive. It's late, and I am tired. Wow. Um, the idea of a witness, um, and we looked at this being, um, uh, Strong's 3144, Martus, and we talked about that the faithful interpreters of God's counsels are called God's witnesses, but look at how this is used in a legal sense. And keep this in mind in terms of, I think you'll see the connections. They're kind of hard to miss. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 15. This is Jesus speaking. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5, um, 19. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. So, um, 2 Corinthians 13. Uh, starts off this way. Um, 2 Corinthians 13. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So two witnesses were needed to establish a matter from a legal perspective. Um, that, that, that is scriptural. But um, look at this. Deuteronomy 17 Verse 2, if a man or woman living among you in one of the towns the Lord gives you is found doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God in violation of his covenant and contrary to my command has worshipped other gods, bowing down to them or to the sun or the moon or the stars in the sky, and this has been brought to your attention, then you must investigate it thoroughly. If it is true and it has been proved that this detestable thing has been done in Israel, take the man or woman who has done this evil deed to your city gate and stone that person to death. On the testimony of two or three witnesses is a person to be put to death. But no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting that person to death. And then the hands of all the people. Wow. Um, from a context standpoint of the two witnesses and that they're tormenting the people on the earth and that they're, they're striking it with plague, the famine, um, turning water to blood. It's it, pretty interesting that the hands of the witnesses... And it must be at least two, must be the first and putting the person to death that has done these things that 
um, that was, were just talked about. Um, pretty fascinating when you make those kind of connections to the two witnesses and their prophecy against perhaps the, the all, all the inhabitants of the earth that um, did not accept Christ. Um, and then Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Um, again, it says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. And we talked about this in a previous video, but um, this does not mean that like, if you come to faith in Jesus and then you sin or have sin problem, that you've not got fully under control, that you've lost your salvation. That means that the, the people being talked about here are those who have received knowledge of the truth. So they deliberately keep on sinning. They've, they know that there's, a, that there's uh, the truth that tells them that Jesus is the way to be saved from their sin. And the idea that they deliberately keep on sinning after they've received knowledge of the truth means that they've not accepted that truth. And it says no sacrifice for sin is left. It just means that um, there's not another way. Jesus is the only way. Uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so it's like saying they've received knowledge of Jesus, but they've not accepted his sacrifice. And so there's no other sacrifice available to them. But look how that continues here. But only a fear, okay, so no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful, fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. So again, there's, if you have rejected Jesus and, and, and just keep on going your own way without placing your faith in him, what's left for you is a fearful expectation of judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. It continues, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Where we get the, 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 the verse, people say, you know, they know, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, said the Lord. Um, uh, that's brought up here again. It says, for he, for we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And then again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Um, how much more severely? So like, the, if you... To trample the Son of God underfoot and treat as unholy the blood of the covenant that would sanctify you, it means to reject Jesus. So if you've received knowledge of Jesus, and if you've watched the early part of my video, you now have knowledge of Jesus. And if you reject that, there is no sacrifice for sins left for you. You only have judgment and consuming fire to look forward to. And if two witnesses were enough to put someone to death, um, according to the law of Moses, how much more so is punishment going to be inflicted? Um, in the context of two witnesses, um, it's very fascinating. And again, I, I don't, I just don't see a message of repentance in this part of the story. Um, Again, look at look at the point of all the prophecies against other nations in the Old Testament. It was, and then you will know that I am the Lord. After the punishment and the judgment comes, then you will know that I'm the Lord. And that's what we see. We see that here. Um, it's a lot to take in. Um, and again, I'm... Uh, uh, I, I do read some of this stuff with a lump in my throat, man. I, I, I do not take great pleasure in saying that I don't see a great revival here. Um, it kind of sucks, to be honest. Um, but I'm just telling you what I believe Scripture's saying. 
Um, I know there'll be those that disagree with that, and that's okay. Again, man, this is not salvation. So, um, you know, we can agree to disagree on interpretations, but I just, as I look at what Scripture says uh, in this part of the story, as I look at what it doesn't say, and then as I look at parallels to that, there are so many instances of prophets speaking prophecy against um, against their audience without a call to repentance. Um, I think um, you don't want to be here to find out if there's a message of repentance in there that we're just not told about. Because they're going to torment people who live on the earth for three and a half years. And um, you don't want to be here for that, friends. You, you got to go through all manner of hell on earth um, to find out the answer to that. The answer you need to concern yourself with is, if you don't know Jesus, what are you waiting on? Believe in him today. Place your faith in him. You can come to a, a saving faith in him and receive the gift of salvation and eternal life that is offered through his death and his blood shed on the cross. Um, my brothers and sisters in Christ, um, I love you guys. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight. It's um, it's always a pleasure, and I do appreciate all the encouragement. It's just, um, it really does feel like a family a lot of times, um, even the, the, the sometimes we disagree with one another um, and come at things from a different way, and that's okay too, if where I'm concerned. Um, but uh, I do pray, man, consistently for your friends and your family and your loved ones that are outside of relationship with Christ. To me, I don't, um, I don't continually bring up my alternative uh, minority, whatever you want to call it, my interpretation of things that are different from the traditional view. I don't bring that up for grins. I don't bring that up to make friends because it doesn't make me a lot of them sometimes. Um, I don't bring it up for any other reason than that interpretation leads me straight to the doorstep of the day of the Lord as the next thing we see. Um, and and that and knowing now what I know about the day of the Lord, um, it's that's it's just a heavy piece. So I do. Uh, I lift up your. I lift up your friends, your family, your parents, your children, your loved ones that are outside of a relationship with Jesus, that they would come to know him while there is time. And uh, God willing, I'll be back soon with another study. And um, until then, I love you guys. Bye-bye.